Okay. Um, as you can see today, we'll, uh, we'll look at modeling volatility and uh, economic forecasting. Um, as usual, we'll, uh, we'll have a quick look at what we did last week. So what we did last week, we looked at uh, VAR models. We, um, um, if you look at this, this is the VAR1 uh, representation, and we explain how to um, use matrix notation to present the VAR model. This is VAR1 because we have only one leg of the um, uh, endogenous variables on the right-hand side. And as we said, this could be a vector of uh, um, dependent variables, and it could be um, any number of, of, of uh, uh, endogenous variables. So also we can add exogenous uh, variables into a VAR model. We, um, if we, if we want to just highlight like the steps that we uh, should go through if we estimate a VAR model, then the first one, you should make sure that you have I0 or stationary series. Then you should make sure that you include the uh, appropriate lag length, and then you make sure the, the model is stable. Then you can use the uh, Granger causality test to test the causality where, which in which direction it's going to. Is it unidirectional or bidirectional causality between any of the variables including the model and we uh, produce the impulse response function to see the impact of uh, any shock in the model so you shock one variable and see how this will impact the other endogenous variables in in the model and also you can produce the variance decomposition and we explain what that means last uh, last week we also explained the uh, idea of uh, regressing non-stationary uh, series, and we explained that this could lead to uh, superior regression, and uh, the main problem comes from the what happened to the, uh, the error term, so or the assumptions that we make about the error term. So at least three of the assumptions of the classical linear regression model are violated when we regress non-stationary uh, series. Um, then uh, we said, okay, so if we have a combination of uh, non-stationary series, y and x, that can produce, so if we have these, uh, these two constants, pi 1, pi 2, that can produce uh, an error term that is stationary, and in this case we could say that these two variables, y and x, are co-integrated, meaning they, they have a long-run relationship. So that means that that, that that happen only if the errors are stationary. So if we have i1 variables, x and, and y, and when you regress these two, so we've got these two constants, pi 1 and pi 2, that would make the error stationary, and that means that is an indication that the uh, the two variables, the two series y and x are are stationary. So uh, sorry, are co-integrated, meaning they they they, uh, they move together in the long run, or they have a long run equilibrium relationship. And we saw an example last uh, last week. Then we move to discuss the error correction model, and this is the representation of the error correction model, and this, this part is the error correction uh, mechanism, and we explain that this part of the equation delta xt that represent the uh, short-run dynamics of the model, and this part here is the error correction mechanism, and we understand that, or we expect that this psi here, the value of this psi to be less than uh, zero, and we, we show how we learn how to use the uh, Ingle Granger test for integration. We finish the lecture by looking at the vector error correction uh, model, and we show how um, the integration can be also modeled within a modified VAR framework, which is the vector error correction uh, model, which is very similar to the uh, VAR model we explained earlier. And we explained that the um, condition of a stationary uh, uh, linear combination of these two variables, y1 and y2, will depend on the, uh, the rank of this matrix here, uh, pi matrix here, the coefficient matrix. Okay? And we, we show how to use the uh, Johansson test to test for uh, co-integration. So this is what we discussed last week. This lecture we uh, will go with, this is the last lecture on time series uh, econometrics. From next week, we'll, uh, we'll move to panel data. But for this lecture, we will look at modeling volatility. 
and more specifically we'll look at the Osh and Gosh models and the next part of the lecture the second half of the lecture we'll be looking at economic forecasting so let's start with the uh, the the main idea so the main idea here is that financial time series usually they uh, like such as the uh, stock prices, uh, interest rate, foreign exchange rate, they all they usually exhibit this kind of volatility clustering. What does that mean? That if you if you plot the data, you will see some period in which the data feels like an, uh, you should it shows like some kind of volatile behavior, so it's going up and down, and some other periods where it is uh, very uh, calm or relatively relatively calm. So. What are the sources of such volatility? So when you draw this data, why, why at some time you see the data is just going up and down, very volatile, and then some other uh, time you'll see it is very uh, calm and quiet. Um, news could be one source of this uh, uh, volatility. So if something happened in the morning, you could see this will affect the uh, stock prices or uh, the, the interest rate or the, the wherever, and, and, and that would will be... Um, uh, very clear that we will, will be shown in the behavior of these uh, financial time series. Also, economic events have some impact on a uh, time series pattern of the asset prices. So that the reason is that news can be uh, uh, interpret in different in different ways, and this will have some impact. Or if we have an oil crisis or an oil price shock, again this impact might. Uh, last for some for some time so this is this is the idea so the the main idea here is that how can we uh, model this volatility or this this behavior of the data uh, of the data in hand so um, as we said this uh, this this sort of volatility will have some impact if you are investor so you're you mainly concerned about the rate of return on your investment and also you would be concerned about the risk that you have to take on uh, because of this variability all or volatility of of the risk so basically what i'm trying to say here is it's very important to take uh, into consideration this sort of volatility or this sort of behavior when you work on uh, financial time series. Okay, so let's let's think of uh, volatility. How can we measure this sort of volatility? Again, when you plot the data of any financial time series, you will see this this behavior, and we'll see some example now. So you'll see how it goes up and down, and sometimes this would be like very like very fast and some other time you'll see like he's very is very calm and slow so it's uh, it's it's something very well known in in uh, financial time series so a simple way to measure um volatility uh, asset return volatility or any sort of uh, financial time series volatility is to look at its variance over time so if we look at the variance itself at any point, the, the variance itself doesn't capture this volatility clustering, doesn't capture this behavior, okay? Because what we do when, when we look at the variance at a at, at single point, at, at any point. So we look at the, um, w w basically when you calculate the variance, what you do is you subtract the mean from individual values and then you square the difference and divide this by the number of observations. So what you're gonna have at this point is the unconditional variance. So it's a single number that doesn't capture what we would call the time varying volatility. So it's not going to show the volatility over over time. So this is the, the if, if we look at the unconditional uh, variance. So what's more important is to look at the conditional uh, variance or what we call the time varying uh, volatility. So what we call the ARSH model or the ARSH effect. So this is the autoregressive uh, conditional heteroscedasticity and that's what we're trying to, to model, that's what we're trying to learn how to model today. So as we explained, this, is, this behavior is important to take into consideration when you model time series data or financial time series uh, data in particular. Okay, so Let's have um, let's have an example. But before we jump to the example, as I said, this is the what it means the ARSH model. As I said, the autocorrelated uh, it's autoregressive. Sorry, um, conditional heteroscedasticity. And the reason we do that because this sort of heteroscedasticity is autocorrelated over time. So do you remember what what we mean by heteroscedasticity? We explained this before. 
So what does it mean? Exactly. So, so exactly. So uneven variance. So an otic relation. So do you remember when we said heteroscedasticity is something that is common in cross-section data? And we explain why. Why is it common with cross-section data? Because the heterogeneity among individual units or, 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 uh, or the, uh, uh, when you look at firms, for example, so they are of different sizes, they have different circumstances. If you look at countries, again, it applies it. If you actually try and model data uh, related to uh, individuals, again, individuals have different abilities, different unobservables and, and stuff like that. So this sort of heterogeneity, this bring the uh, heteroscedasticity issue. Okay, so this is the uneven variance. So it's not, and that's very common in in cross-section data. Okay, and autocorrelation. We explain autocorrelation as well. So autocorrelation when you have the exactly. So so that's that's that happened with the error term again. So again, it's correlated with itself over time. Okay, and which we could call the serially auto serial autocorrelation. So the problem here with this sort of data, the financial uh, time uh, uh, series data with these sort of data is actually have both. So this kind, this would explain this clustering. This would explain this uh, volatility clustering. Okay, and how 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 likely if this if in time uh, t the uh, volatility was high, it is likely that it will be high in time t plus one time t plus one. So that's just like, and if it was calm in time t, it's likely to be calm in, in ti time t minus, uh, time t plus one. Okay, and, and that is the main idea of uh, autocorrelated heteroscedasticity. And as we said, this is something we explained before. So heteroscedasticity or un unequal variance or non-constant variance is very common in cross-section data and we explain this because of the heterogeneity among individual cross-section units okay so if you're modeling countries countries are very different it doesn't matter really how many variables you'll include in your model there's still some other variables that is not captured in your model and these they are very heterogeneous group so in terms of economic development in terms in terms of institutions in terms of culture aspect religion aspect so there's so many variables that you're not able or you you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to include enough variables to capture all these heterogeneity okay and that's why we see this heteroscedasticity very common in uh, uh, cross-section data okay and on the other side time series data we usually observe autocorrelation and if you think of this if unemployment is unemployment rate is high this uh, this in time t so probably it's it's not going to change significantly in time t minus one it's not going to drop in, in, in one time period, in, in one day or in one week, it depends on like how the, the frequency of your, of your data or in a month or in a quarter. So again, it will be correlated with what happened from previously. We, we explained this by the, uh, the uh, worker uh, strike. If they, if they do some kind of, um, if some similar event happened in this T and time T, which affect the output or GDP in time T or the output in time T is likely to have some impact that is uh, 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 affect the output in time T plus one again. So that's, that is the idea of the, and, and that's why we, we usually observe this uh, sort of autocorrelation with time series data, okay? But with financial data, we observe this autocorrelated heteroscedasticity uh, and, and, and that what happened here, heteroscedasticity observed over different periods of uh, is autocorrelated. And that's what I meant when I said this sort of behavior of the data, which we will see in a minute, you will see that it's, if it is very volatile at, in, at some point, it's likely to be volatile in the next time. Okay, on t in time t plus one. If it was very calm and quiet and at some point, so it's likely to be the same at the uh, uh, t plus one. That's what we're trying to, well, with usually with financial data, you're probably talking about daily returns or daily, yes, yeah, so you can get, you can get this very, uh, 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 highly frequent data is very easy. And that's why, if you remember in one of the lectures, I said the guys who work in f in, in on financial data, they are luckier than us, uh, than we are in economics, because we usually, if you have quarterly data, you feel very pleased as, <laughs> as a macroeconomist. But if you, 
if you work with financial data, yes, you can even get uh, hourly data if you want. So uh, daily data, yeah, mainly, and that's what we'll see now. Uh, we look at an example uh, using exchange rate daily uh, 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 data for exchange rate. So what we just explained now, it's called the ARSH effect. Okay, so what's ARSH is auto regressive uh, conditional heteroscedasticity. Okay, and that's what we, we just explained now, the idea of this um, heteroscedasticity over time that is autocorrelated. Okay, and so, and, and, and that actually get these two quite uh, two together, these uh, two parts together, the heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation. So this, that caused this volatility clustering, okay? And that explained the behavior. So let's jump to an example and see how that, how that actually works. So the example we have today in the data uh, is already now in Blackboard. So the example we have is for the exchange rate between the US dollar and the euro. Uh, so that means dollars per unit of, of euro. Uh, we've got daily uh, data from January uh, 4th, 2000 to, to May uh, 8th, 2008. And that means we've got 2,035, uh, 2,355 um, observations. Okay, so when we plot the data, and that's why I was talking about, if you look at this, so again, look at the how the um, the exchange rate uh, of the euro first it was depreciating somehow. Like so, you, you can see observe a, a trend. So you can it's just going down. So it's, it's the depreciation, and then afterwards it's kind of appreciation. So you'll see that how the value of the euro is actually increasing against the uh, the um, the dollar, but this is not the point now. This is just the general uh, general trend of the of the series. What I'm what I'm talking about here is this volatility going up and down. So you see this one, the same here, and this here. So if this if this it if if this very volatile at some point, so it's in the t plus one in the next time period or the next day, it's likely to to uh, to follow the same. The same pattern. If you want to make uh, make it clear, if you want to see this sort of volatility, you can uh, 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 just plot the difference. Okay. So if we plot the difference, so that just imagine there's like a line here from zero. So you will see what I'm talking about. This sort of volatility. So it seems to be more volatile in the uh, beginning of the sample, but when you go when you move toward the the, 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 this part here, it's less volatile, it's quiet. So if you compare the volatility here, if you compare how, how fast or how far it goes up and down, you'll see this one is very quiet, this one is very volatile. So this one is less volatile compared to this, this part. So again, this is exactly the same here. I just wanted to show you what we mean by this sort of volatility clustering, how, how it works, how it is uh, this sort of um, autocorrelated uh, heteroscedasticity, how, how, this, how would this explain this, what we see, the volatility? And that's what we're going to see in a minute now. But on, on the graph, is, is in addition to the, the general trend, like the trend of whether the, the uh, value of the, um, the euro is appreciation or is appreciated or depreciated against the, the US dollar, this is what you can see from the general trend. But if you look at these, uh, volatility. So you'll see how these are correlated. For example, you see this one was down, this one slightly very similar pattern to this one, but then once we, it became more volatile going going that way, is to continue going that way, and then again it's here. If you look at this, you will see it's not going the same way, so it's, it's, it became more uh, or less volatile in this part. And as I said, if you want to see it clearly, probably this is a good way to to see it. So it's it's on this side and this side in the beginning of the sample. So you'll see how uh, it's more volatile compared to the end of this uh, sample. Okay, and only the only difference is just I I just uh, took the uh, log changes. Um, the difference of these log changes. Uh, so. Okay, so now we're just talking about the variance and volatility. So if we if we calculate the variance, you remember what I said about the variance? The variance is not going to capture this volatility crust clustering or this time varying variance. It's not going to be captured by just 
the variance, the unconditional variance. So basically, this is the this number give us the um, the unconditional variance for this data for this series. Okay, it doesn't really capture the volatility. It doesn't really capture what you've seen here. Okay, so if you just by looking at this, you're not going to know much about this volatility. Okay, or this behavior because the variance is just how how spread the data around the uh, uh, around the mean, yeah, how far it goes here. So that's that's the the, the it's, it's, it's not it's not capturing this conditional uh, uh, heteroscedasticity or autocorrelated heteroscedasticity. So it's not going really to capture what we've uh, we've seen on on the graph, and uh, a simple way to capture this volatility is to run a regression. If we run a regression of the data of the series in time t. So this could be anything, so it could be any y, t, so uh, here's just a uh, daily return, or it could be the exchange rate in the previous example, or it could be any, any y, so any dependent variable, any, any financial uh, series and time t, equal constant plus an, uh, an error term. So if you obtain the residual from this, and if you square them, so then you may get uh, some a measure of this sort of volatility, and again, we're going to apply this to the same uh, the, to the same series, to the exchange rate, and we'll see how this works. But before that, let me show you the, the estimation. So what we have here is just the Euler's estimation of this equation, okay? But and wha what I have is the exchange rate. It regressed on a constant and an error term, okay? That's all I have. So why, why I'm doing this? Because I want to get the residual. So I want to get the residuals from this estimation. So what we have here, so this is probably the, what is this value? This is probably the, the mean. Okay, so if you go back to this, so this is exactly, this is the, the mean of the uh, series. Okay? And, um, yeah, so what we want to see here, this what you see here is the residual square. So again, it tells us it shows the same, exactly the same thing. What can you see here? So you see how volatile in the beginning of the sample, and then at the end of the sample, it's, it's more, it's quiet here, so it's, it's less volatile here. So again, this is another way to hope probably to capture this sort of, uh, of movement or, or volatility over uh, over time. So this is uh, like s a very simple way to show volatility. So again, that's what we're trying to say here. So is the variance, the unconditional variance might not be the best way to, is not going to capture actually this sort of volatility. So that's why we're trying to find a way how to model it, how to, how to capture it, how to explain this sort of behavior in financial uh, data. Okay, so as we explained, this is this is something can be taken as an indicator for uh, volatility. So this is, as we said, is very clear how volatile in this uh, area and compared to this area, how quiet the series is is here is very, very uh, or less less volatile. So this is this is very uh, uh, important, and uh, and and this is something we already explained. So these sort of clusters or this sort of volatility is autocorrelated. Okay, and that means when volatility is high, it's likely to continue to be high for some time. When volatility is low, it would continue to be low for a while, and that is the idea of the uh, 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 the autocorrelated uh, uh, heteroscedasticity or the uh, the volatility we were trying to to capture here or the behavior we're trying to to model uh, here. So how how would Ash model work then how how Ash model capture this sort of volatility so what we have here is the dependent variable yt let's say this is the this is the exchange rate um, given or conditioned on the uh, information available up to t minus 1 so to time t minus 1 so the previous period which is yesterday because we've got daily data here so t minus one so if you're talking about yt today up to given or condition on the information that is available up to t minus one which meaning up to yesterday this will depend on uh, some uh, constant here and 
this is the xt so the sort of uh, uh, regressors and then plus plus an error term so the idea here is that the this error term the y uh, the ut here again this will be conditioned on the information condition on the information available up to uh, uh, t minus one okay will be um, identical independently distributed normal distribution and the, the 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 this is the mean so this is zero but what is more interesting is this this part here the sigma square uh, sigma t square so this is the variance so what is different here in this in this expression what is unusual here like what well, this is what what we haven't seen before is the subscript so what we usually assume with the classical regression model, we assume that this is variance, uh, is sigma square is constant without this t. So th this is not, it's not dependent on time, okay? And this is, as we said, this is one of the classical linear regression model assumptions that would make, if they are valid, if they are true, this will make the OLS blue, and that's what we want. But so the difference here today is that actually we're going to allow for this to happen. We're going to allow for this variance to be dependent on time. So it will have this sort of um, uh, su subscript T. And that's why we can, you see, this is the YT given. So we want to take all the information available up to T minus, uh, minus <coughs> 1. So as I said, so the classical linear regression model assumes that this is homoscedastic variance, meaning that the variance is sigma square. So there's no su subscripts. It doesn't depend on anything. It's just a constant. Okay. But to take into account the Arsh effect to be able to model this sort of uh, volatility clustering, then we need to uh, we need to allow this to happen. So I'll, uh, sigma uh, t squared. This the variance in this case will depend on a constant lambda zero plus uh, another part which is the lambda one u t minus one squared so that is this is the coming from the past this is the the yesterday this is the uh, error term from uh, the t time t minus uh, t, t minus uh, one so that's what we assume so we assume that the error variance this one at time t is equal to the sum of constant, which is lambda zero plus uh, constant multiplied by the square uh, error term of the previous time uh, time period. So this is something we're gonna allow for to capture this Arsh effect. So the interesting thing here is, what if this lambda uh, one equals zero? So what? So exactly, so this will cancel out, yeah? So that means this variance will be constant. Then all the classical linear regression model assumptions apply, so there's no problem now. So it is homoscedastic error. So if we test for this, and this is not, this is not significantly uh, different from zero, so this is like, it's not statistically different from zero. If it is zero, that means the variance actually is constant, and that means there is no Arsh effect, okay? So that is the, the interesting part here. So if lambda 1 equals 0, then the error variance, um, the, the, the variance of this error would be uh, 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 homoscedastic, so meaning that we have a constant variance. And this is, as we said, this is uh, 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 an important assumption of the uh, 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 classical linear regression model. Okay, so basically one more thing we would expect about these coefficients here in uh, lambda zero and lambda one we would expect these to be uh, positive because this is variance so we would expect we can we wouldn't expect these to be negative values okay because with the variance you actually square so that means it should be uh, it should be positive Okay, so this is one thing. So the so the idea here now. So again, just going back to the main model. So what we're trying to model here, this sort of volatility, but how? So we 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 have y t conditioned on information up to t minus one, depend on constant x t and u t. So if you take the mathematical expectation of these of both sides of these two sides, the this will be conditional mean. It will be alpha plus beta x t, and the conditional variance equation will be 
what we just showed what I just showed you now, which is the sigma t squared will equal uh, be equal um, lambda zero plus lambda one u t minus one squared. So that means these are conditional on the information uh, set i t minus uh, minus one. So why should we go only for uh, one leg of the earth term? Okay, what we see now is h one. H one means like we get only one uh, one leg. So we can include more than one leg of the uh, uh, squared value of the earth term. So we can extend this. Rather than having h1, we could have h p. P here is the uh, uh, how many lags we um, we go in the pass. Okay, so that could be sigma t squared equal lambda zero plus lambda one. So we have here t minus one. So the squared error for t minus two up to the uh, uh, t minus p. Okay, so p this is just how many lag we want to to capture. So, if there is an Arsh effect, so what we would expect, so this is like the more general form now. What, we, what I showed you in the beginning, this equation with Arsh1, so we're looking at, li uh, at only Arsh1, so we're looking at one leg. But if we extend this to a number of legs, then we actually want to test the is, uh, statistical significance of these coefficients. Because is the same concept applies here, so if this one is found to be zero or not uh, different from zero, that means the variance is constant, okay, and we don't have Arsh effect. But if this was uh, statistically significant, meaning it's different from zero, it's not zero, okay, that means this is evidence we have Arsh effect, okay, and this is something we need to keep or we need to consider if we model any uh, this uh, this series, the exchange rate series, okay. So the same thing applies if we have more uh, uh, more than one lag. So if we have this the general form h p p here is the number of lags, then we could actually test this whether these are statistically significant or not. So we test all these lambdas, the all these coefficients, okay. Or you can test them individually as well. So you see which lag. Uh, has this sort of uh, or passing this sort of uh, impact or effect. So if they are significantly different from zero, then we can conclude that we have Arsh, uh, Arsh effect. Okay. So this is how to test whether we have Arsh effect or not. Okay. So um, how would we estimate this? So sigma t squared. We don't know sigma t squared. Why? Because this is from this is the error, yeah? We don't know the error term. Do we? Do we observe it? So we don't observe the error term. What we observe is actually coming from the sample, yeah? So that's what we, we observe. So what we will have here, because u is not uh, directly observable, this is something we don't see. So what we use in a state is the residuals, okay? So the residuals is just first three fours. This is what we have after the estimation. So you get the residuals. And then you exactly follow the same model. So this is exactly the same as this one. It's just the difference we use the um, the, uh, the residuals, because that's what we can observe. We can't observe the error term. We we don't observe the error term. Okay. So we are regressing the residuals, yes, on on its uh, lagged values, and then the uh, conditional heteroskelicity here, meaning that it's conditioned on the information up to t minus one. We already explained this uh, this point. So this is the estimation. Okay. So what we have here, the residual. So let's just go back to the equation. So so you want this the residual square, yeah. So what we have here, this is the dependent variable. Okay. And on a constant, this is lambda zero. Okay which is C here, and then plus eight lags. Why eight lags? This is just an example. You could include any number of lags, okay? You could include only five, four, or maybe nine. So I'm just, for like demonstration, uh, I just put eight lags. So we just want to see how, wh what we got here in this, in this estimation. So 
there's, w- there's one clear problem here. I mean, you see like some significant, because the idea here is that to test these are significant or not, the coefficient here, yeah? Because if these are significant, if they are statistically significant, that means we have we can conclude that we have an uh, uh, we have arch effect and we should keep this in the model. Okay, so looking at eight lags here or arch eight, it seems that some of these are some some of these are uh, are, are, are statistically significant. But there's one problem. The problem here is that we expect this coefficient to be positive. But with all this estimation, there's nothing to guarantee that this will be positive. As you can see, this one is negative. So this is something that we, it shouldn't happen because this is the variance. So we, you, you get the, the, the squared value. So that means it should be positive. And this is something we, we explained here, if you remember. Yeah. So we assume that these coefficients are, are positive. Okay. So the problem here is that with the OLS estimation, so nothing to guarantee that this will happen. And also, we to get the residual and to get the to, to do the to do this estimation, we had first we had to estimate the model first, and then obtain the residuals, uh, get the squared residuals, and then you run another regression of the of the variance. So with and 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 at the end we end up with some negative values and as i said there's no nothing to guarantee that this will be positive although we actually expect them to be uh, positive so that's for that for this reason uh we would expect uh we we should use the maximum likelihood uh, approach which uh, give us the opportunity to estimate these two equations uh simultaneously so the mean equation which is the the first equation the first estimation we had yeah so this is the first estimation and then you get the residual from this and then you run the the other the the the, the second one which the variance equation so with with the uh, with the um, maximum likelihood so we don't need we don't have to do both we don't have to do two steps, so we can have it simultaneously. And as I said, what if you do ARSH in, in EVUs, so mainly what you have is the maximum likelihood estimation, not the OLS estimation. Okay? So I'm not going to, te- to, to explain what that uh, 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 means, the maximum likelihood, what it does, but because, as I said, like it's, it's built in, uh, in, in EVUs, so just to be cautious when, when you... Um, I'll show you in a minute how to do this in EVUs, but... When you uh, when you do it in views, you should understand that this is not all less estimation. This is uh, uh, ML uh, estimation. Okay, not not all less. So in views, it's very straightforward to do what I just did now. So what I did, I did the ARSH eight. So if I want to do this, so you go to um, quick the menu quick estimate equation, and before um, this was all less. So once you change this to ARSH, the autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity, this dialog box will appear, okay? So first you need to change, if you go to the estimation setting and change this from OLS to uh, uh, ARSH, okay? This will give you this sort of uh, uh, dialog box, which is very straightforward. So what we have here, this is the main equation. So we have the dependent variable is the series we want to model here, which is the exchange rate. And we regress this on a constant. That's what exactly what I did. So I regress this on a constant, and then the constant is, uh, is, is, is C, so that's how if you understand it. Um, and then you will see here, this is the number of lags. So I'm trying to estimate here, I'm trying to uh, model ARSH8. So I want to include 8 eight lags. It's just to replicate the estimation or to get the same estimation of the ARSH8 that I had before. When I explained why I did eight lags, I said this is just an example. You could try any number of lags, uh, more or less uh, 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 than eight. So this is not the point here. It's just we want to do the exactly the same using the uh, 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 ML or uh, maximum likelihood method and uh, using uh, eViews. So again, so it's very, very straightforward. Once you do that, so this is you specify your equation here. You decide on the number of lags here. 
the uh, uh, p, so p equal 8 in this estimation, and this is what you get, just to zoom in, to be able to see this. So this is the first part of the equation, or the mean equation. So this is the estimation of the first one, this is what we did first. And then the variance equation, yeah, just to show you, uh, here when you did the R, so this is the maximum likelihood, so it doesn't show you the OLS, so this is not the OLS estimation, okay? And just the only reason that we explain that, so the reason is that with the OLS, nothing uh, would guarantee that these coefficient is going to are going to be uh, positive, and this is something we should expect. We should expect them to be positive. With all this, we should I showed you how some in some uh, uh, cases you will find negative coefficients. So with the uh, and also in this case with EVUs, then you don't have to estimate two equations. It just uh, one uh, um, one step you get both equations: the uh, the mean equation and the variance equation. So this is the variance equation. So again, let me remind you what this is. This is exactly what we have. Okay? So this is the residual square in time t. Depends on constant lambda 0. And lambda 0 here is this is what you see in the variance equation. So this is the uh, lambda 0. This is the stomatic coefficient for lambda 0. And then these are the eight lags okay of the uh, squared uh, uh, residuals so what we see here so what why are we doing this why, wha what does that tell us so there's there's evidence yes so there's evidence we have arch effect why because you see these are significant and that's the idea so we're looking at going back to the same equation so this is what we're trying to to do we're trying to test whether these coefficients are statistically significant or not. If they are, that means there's Osh effect and it's something we need to capture in the model. If not, there's no problem because if they are zero, so if these are zero, that means these all will cancel out and then the variance will be constant, will be only lambda zero. And that's the main, that's the main point. So we have a uh, uh error and that wouldn't be uh, an issue if if we uh, couldn't uh, reject the the null hypothesis or when we test the st statistical significance of these uh, coefficients. Okay. It shouldn't, be it shouldn't be negative because the variance when you when you when you when you obtain the value of the variance is squared, it, so it should be positive. But you don't get the change. So we're not looking at the change. I understand your points if 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 there's more than but you don't get the change. If you get the change you would exp you would see a negative value, but you we don't do that. So if you go back to the equation, this is not the change. It's just the the uh, um Yeah, no, it's not how different it is. It's 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 yesterday. It's how how much it was yesterday. How much it was the day before? Yeah. How much it was the day after? Yeah. So, so it's, it's you take the value of that. It's not. It's not how much is different. How much it is different from today? So you're not looking at the difference. Okay. So it's just the value. So this is this is the. So it depends on the error from t minus two. It's just the value. Yeah, and it's and it's and it's squared. So even if it was negative. So when you see, if if you look at the mean equation, yeah. and you see the how, what is the residual? It's just the how the difference between this and the actual point, yeah. So so it could be above, so it could be positive, or it could be below, meaning it would be negative, yeah? yeah. But if you square, yeah. then it doesn't matter where it is; it will be always a. Oh, okay. it's it's No, no, yeah, no. That yeah, that's 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 why we shouldn't see this negative. Yes, okay. that's why we should expect them to be positive. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's that's right. Okay. So 
So that's the idea here. So w what we're trying just to do, uh, to go back to the, same p the, the, the important point here is we're trying to see whether we have Osh effect or not, whether we have this sort of volatility clustering. From the graph, when we looked at the graph, we have it. Okay, so it's, it's, it's very clear in the graph. But when you, when you estimate the model, you actually have evidence as well. There's, there's a, an Osh effect, and you need to, to capture this in, into the model. Okay. Okay. So this is one thing. The um, and as I said, this is the uh, the the maximum likelihood estimation. Um, there are some drawbacks of the Arch model. One is that it requires estimation of the coefficient of B autoregressive terms. So that could be uh, I no. Is it eight? Is it ten? Should I how how far should I go back? How far back I should go? But this would consume some degrees of freedom. Uh, also difficult to interpret these coefficients, okay? And as I said, especially if you're using OLS to estimate them and then you get a negative coefficient, how would you interpret that? It, it would be difficult. So the literature suggests to use, if you have Arch 3 or higher order, so if you have anything above that, Arch 4, like meaning if you consider like the case we had, we had eight, Osh eight, so we consider eight lags. So for any case above Osh three, as much it is better or it is recommended to use Gauche model rather than Osh. And that's what we explain, what, what that Gauche means, which is like generalized Osh, okay? So the idea here with the Gauche or generalized uh, autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity is that we modify the variance equation so this is the same equation we've seen before, but we add to it this, this part here. So the first part, which is the, the conditional variance at time t, depend on the first part is, is the same with Osh. So this one we had before, the lag squared error term at time t minus 1, which is this one. So this part here is the Osh. This is what we saw with the Osh model. Yeah? But this part, we add also the lag variance term at time t minus 1. So we add here, we, we add to the Osh model we had before, to this equation. So we add to this equation the, the variance in time t minus 1. Okay, so this is exactly the same equation, plus with the generalized uh, Osh, we would have one more term here, which is the lagged variance term at time t minus, uh, minus 1. Okay, so it, it can be shown actually that Osh P, so uh, if any order, can be equivalent to Gosh 1 1. So as you increase P, which is the order of this Osh model, so you said anything from 3 above, like 4, Osh 4, 5, 6, whatever, so as you increase the uh, order of this uh, or the how many lags you include, it would be actually, it could be shown that Gosh 1 1 would actually give you the same. So it would actually capture the same sort of, uh, of volatility. So with Osh P, you would have to estimate P plus 1. And this is something we talk about how it consumes uh, the degrees of freedom. So with Osh P, you would have to estimate P plus 1 coefficient. But with Gosh 1, you would, Gosh 1 1, you would expect to uh, estimate three coefficients. And if this gives you the same, if it does the same job, that then this, this one is, is more preferred because you would only uh, uh, estimate three, three coefficients. So what is 1, 1 here? So 1 is this la the lag of this, the u uh, t uh, uh, minus 1, the, the, the squared uh, term of the uh, error term. And the other one here is the how many lags you would have for the, for the variance. So... Uh, also, you could extend this to more lags. So you could have a more like extended model where you have gosh, P, Q. So P here will be the lagged square error terms. The Q will be the lagged conditional uh, variance terms. But as I said, in practice, it's, 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 uh, the gosh one one is, uh, is, uh, is found to be useful. So it's found to be, uh, to be doing the same job. So you wouldn't probably need to do more uh, uh, lags, or you don't. You wouldn't need to have more lags than only one lag. If you do gosh, gosh mod. So how how can we do this in in eviews? In eviews, it's very straightforward, because 
what, all what you need to do is just if you compare this with, again, so remember to change this box here. Remember to change the estimating uh, settings to from all less because all less is the default one to ash. Once you do that, you will see this dialog box. Going back to just compare what we had in this one. So we had ash 8. So that gosh was 0. So all what I need to do now, if I want to do 1, 1, so I want to change this to 1, ash to 1, and gosh to 1. So I want to, to estimate gosh 1, 1. And that's what we did here. That's what I did here. So you will see we have ARSH1. So it's only one lag of the air term. Yeah, for the air term part. And this the uh, one lag for the conditional variance. Okay. Here's the estimation. Um, so that's what we have. So this is the GAUSH11. One one. So the first part, again, again, this is the maximum likelihood method. So it's not all less estimation. Uh, the first part here is the uh, mean equation. Okay, and the second part of this table is the um, the variance equation. So, what is what is this one? What's the first one? So, go back to the equation. Just remember, this is lambda lambda one. Okay, and gosh here is the lambda two is the conditional variance. Going back to this, yeah. So, gosh, this one, gosh minus one. This is the conditional variance. This is the lambda 1. So this is lambda 1, lambda, uh, lambda 2, and the first one is here is lambda 0. So going back to the, the equation again, sorry. So going back, so we've got three coefficients here, remember? Remember, this is one of the advantages of, uh, of having gosh rather than having osh 8 or, or more. So you would uh, need to estimate only three uh, parameters here, lambda 0, lambda 1, and lambda 2. And that's what we have here. So, And that will... Um, make you like you don't need then to do um, any uh, uh, ash model of higher order, so you don't need really to do that. So it would, it would do the same job. So what is the conclusion here? Do we have ash effects or not? Yes, we do. It's significant. That's what we're looking at. Yeah. So going back to this equation, so that's what it's, it's exactly the same concept. So if these are zero, then we would have homoscedastic error, but these are not zero. They are not statistically different from zero. Given the estimation we have now is highly significant. That is an indication uh, that we have ARSH effect. This has the sort of uh, volatility crust clustering that we need to take into consideration if we model uh, this sort of data. Uh, in, in our example, is the exchange rate. Okay? So... There are some extensions to this uh, this model. So we're not going to cover all the extensions of this model. We're going to just give an example of gosh M. With the gosh M, M here, because you modify the mean equation. Remember, when we when we change this gosh to gosh, we modified the uh, variance equation. Okay. So this is the variance equation. This is the the main one. So this is the variance equation. What we did is just we modified this to this one to obtain the gosh, the gosh model. So we just added this term. Okay? So when we modified with this, we modified the variance equation. With gosh m, you modified the mean equation. Okay? So how would we do that? What, what do we need to add or what should we add in the mean equation to obtain the um, or to use gosh m model? Uh, we introduce risk factor or the conditional variance into the uh, the mean equation. So the only difference here you would see is this sigma uh, t squared. So that is added to the mean equation to capture the risk factor or the conditional variance is as part of the, the mean uh, equation. So how do you do this in, in AViews? It's very straightforward. So again, we have gosh 1, 1. Just one lag for the uh, uh, error uh, lag uh, values, so it's t minus 1. And for the conditional variance, one lag, so we have gosh 1, 1. So if you want to do the m, so if you want to modify the mean equation by adding the variance, you'll see. So this is exactly, so you need to change the arch m to the variance. So if you compare this to what how it was before, if you look at the arch m box, it is none. So that means there was no risk factor included into the mean equation. So once you change this to include the variance, you're actually estimating the gosh M model. 
Okay, so the difference here, as we said, so we explicitly introduce in the main equation, we introduce the risk factor, which is the conditional variance as part of the, as a, an additional term to the, uh, the mean, uh, mean equation. And again, by looking at the estimation, so this is, this is the only change we made here, just this one to the variance. And this one is gosh one one as, as before. So we didn't change much. We just changed this. Option, this, this is the estimation. Again, this is the maximum likelihood estimation. So what we have here, so this is the factor we introduced, the Gauss one in the mean equation. And it seems to be significant. That, that is an indication that is important to take this into consideration. The same thing applies here. We get the, uh, there's, there's evidence of having uh, um, Osh effect in this, in this series, and which, which we should consider if we're going to model this, uh, uh, if we want to model the behavior of this of this series, and also it is useful to include uh, this risk factor because it seems to be significant uh, here as well. Okay, so that is the idea of volatility: how to model volatility using Osh and Gauche model. Any question? Okay. Because this is, this is the first part of the lecture, that's why I wanted to start with is volatility and how we model volatility using the Osh and Gauche model. And you, when you saw the how the exchange rate series be behave, it's, it's very obvious that there's uh, like some time of, uh, uh, it, it becomes sometimes very volatile and then some, some other time become less volatile and this is the, the, these are autocorrelated. So this sort of uh, over time. So you need to capture this in, in your model if you want to uh, uh, model any uh, financial uh, series. Okay, uh, the second part of the lecture is the economic forecasting because one of the uh, main objectives of doing regression or of, of modeling is to be able to forecast, of is to be able to, t to say something about the future, about what if, what if this happened? What is going to happen in the future? Okay, so uh, uh, economic forecasting or forecasting in general is something important in not just in economics. So for example, in economics, you want to make some sort of like prediction how the consumption would behave or how, the, how much the consumption will change if income change or how much GDP will, uh, will change in the future, how, what, hap what would happen to the unemployment rate, etc. So there are many indicators and macroeconomic variables that we are interested on in forecasting the values for these uh, variables in, in the future. But as I said, it's not something related only to economics because in financial uh, asset management, you would like to uh, again forecast the asset returns, exchange rates, or commodity prices. In financial risk management, again, there are different. So, in different fields, you want to forecast, and that's why we're trying to model. So, if you build a good model, if you construct a good model, then you can use this model to forecast to say something about the future, and that's what we're going to look at briefly today. So as I said, what we do in forecasting, based on the past and current information, based on what we learn about this data, about this, these variables, in the past and now, so the objective is to try to provide some kind of quantitative estimates of the behavior of this data in the future. What is going to happen if, this, if the value of this value, uh, or if, if under any scenario. So you could just make some scenarios. And that's something we're going to look at today. So um, we develop econometric models for that, for that purpose to be able to forecast uh, about, to say something about the future. So forecasting methods, we have uh, several methods of forecasting, but very like the very basic things is just to have to use a regression model, which we already did before, uh, or how to use ARIMA models to, uh, to do forecasting. And this is something we will cover. So we'll cover the first two points today. And as I said, this is like a just a brief introduction to economic forecasting uh, with VAR models. We already did how to submit VAR models uh, last week. And in the seminar this week, we'll have some examples how to use these for forecasting. But for now, we'll look at the first two, the regression models and ARIMA models or uh, books, Jenkins methodology. So we'll, uh, we'll go back to the same example we started with before in the previous lectures which is the consumption function. So if we have a bivariate regression with two variables here, on the left-hand side we have personal consumption, 
and uh, personal consumption expenditure. And on the right hand side, we have personal uh, disposable uh, income. So we want to use this data. We want to use this model. This is a very like simple regression model to forecast the value of this on the dependent variable in the future. Okay, what would happen to this variable in the future? So, just very quick and like quickly, this is the information we already know about this uh, uh, estimation or about this story about this function. The this slope coefficient is the marginal propensity to consume, and from economics already we understand what that means. Um, so the data we use here is the US data from 1960 to 2008, and this data already on uh, on Blackboard. So if you wanna try this uh, after the lecture. Um, what we're trying to do, so the main objective here is to estimate this equation, okay? We wanna do this regression with the objective or the, with the, uh, uh, to, to, to make some prediction about the value of consumption in, in the future. So the why we do this, because we have data from 1960 to 2008, we're not going to use all this data for the estimation. So this will introduce us to what we call the holdover sample. So part of this sample, we're gonna estimate this consumption function using data up to 2004. So we're not going to use the full sample. So the full sample up to 2008, we're gonna use only for the estimation to estimate the regression model, we're gonna use the data from 1960 to 2004. So there are four years, like four more observations. I think it's, it's, it's annual data, I think. Yeah, so we're gonna keep this four observation and that's what, what we call the holdover sample. Okay, why do we do that? We want to evaluate the performance of the estimated, uh, of the estimated model. So let's say now 2005. I have data for 2005, but I didn't use it in the estimation. Then I'm gonna use the model we have to make prediction to forecast the value for 2005. 2005 and then see how close I am from this because this is this is so the main reason to not use all the data into your uh, uh, regression model is because you want to evaluate your your estimated model and and the yeah I mean <laughs> yeah but again so if if your model is good enough it should predict that if it doesn't, which was the case, to be honest, that means your, your model is rubbish, just throw it in the bin. And that's what most people would think after the two th 2008, yeah? So they used like different models for forecasting. Usually central banks use massive models to do that. And then again, we still fail till today to project uh, or to expect this sort of crisis. But that's, that is the case always, we're always learning, yeah? So and that, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do about the uh, trying to learn about the best way to model uh, or to make or to construct these models to enable to be able to predict uh, or to say something about the future. Okay, so again, so this is just a very, as I said, very brief introduction about economic forecasting, and we're trying to use. We're actually looking at a very simple way to do it. So and 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 that is the uh, this this is the example we have today. So we're looking at. Two 1960 to 2004, this is the data we're gonna use for the estimation, and then we're gonna keep the whole over sample from 2005 to 2008. So first we're gonna plot the, the data as, as usual. So what you see now is 1960 to 2004. So this is data for the, the, the part of the sample that I'm gonna use for the estimation, okay? And it, it seems we're like, by just looking at the graph, it seems like, um, this sort of uh, positive correlation between these two. And also it seems like if I use a linear uh, uh, model, it should uh, represent this sort of relationship. So it shouldn't be a problem to use um, um, a linear regression model for this, uh, for this data, okay? So we did the estimation. So this is the estimation. Now, remember, we didn't use the full sample. We used the sample up to 2004. We, we have the holdover sample from 2005 to, to 2008. And again, the reason we do that, we want to evaluate our model. So this is our model. What we have here, this is the marginal propensity to consume. This is the slope coefficient. Well, we would expect it positive and significant. 
There's one problem here, but we're going to just uh, ignore it for, a mo for the moment. This serial correlation problem, when you look at the Durbin-Watson statistics, is very small. I mean, we have a uh, 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 serial correlation or autocorrelation problem. But for now, let's say that we're happy with this model, but that's the model we, we got. And then we'll, we'll deal with this problem later. So now what will we do? This is how we represent this model. This is exactly the same. So this is the constant. This is the estimated coefficient for beta 0. And this is the estimated coefficient, coefficient for beta 1. This is exactly the same. So what we, need, what we want to do now, let's say, or let's assume that we want now to predict, to forecast the value of the personal consumption expenditure in 2005, given the uh, value of the uh, disposable income of 2005, in the same year. So the we know. Remember, we have in the holdover sample we have the data about the about both, about the this income and the person's uh, disposable income and the per, uh, personal uh, uh, consumption expenditure. So now we want to use this model to predict the. Uh, the, the, to forecast the future value of the personal consumption expenditure given the value of the uh, disposable income. So this will take us, before we do that, this will take us to like some special terms we use in forecasting, and this is something you need to be aware of. So first of all, the difference between point and interval uh, forecast. So in point forecast, we provide a single value for each forecast period. But with the interval forecast, we kind of having like a, a range or an interval that will include some uh, some sort of uh, uncertainty around this point uh, uh, forecast. So be above or like it's like lower uh, lower and upper band around this uh, the point forecast. One more thing to know is the ex post and ex ante. So ex, uh, the first of all, the estimation period. The estimation period in our example is from 1960 to 2004. This is what we used uh, for uh, to estimate the model. The ex post forecast period is the holdover sample. This is between 2004 and 2008. The ex ante forecast is the uh, value of the dependent variable beyond the estimation uh, period, but we may not know the regressor for uh, with certain time. So let's, let's look at this on the graph. So this chart shows us what I mean exactly. So this is the estimation period. This is the ex post forecast period. And this is the ex ante forecast period. Because I'm going to forecast now for 2005, remember? But I have the data of 2000, 2005. We already we have this is the holdover sample. Okay? And the reason we do that, because if we are very close to the values here, Okay, if the, the value that we, we forecast is very close to the consumption expenditure at this point, that means the model is, is good, and then we can use it to, to forecast out, like out sample forecast, or go to the, uh, this period, the ex ante uh, forecast period. So we can do this from 2009 and, and forward. Okay, so one more thing before we do it, we use the regression model to, to do the, the forecast. So the conditional forecast and the unconditional forecast. The conditional forecast, so if we forecast the variable of interest conditional on the assumed value of the regressor. So if you go back to this, what I said, we want to forecast the value of the personal consumption expenditure given the or condition on the value of the personal disposable income. And that's what we mean by the conditional um, conditional forecast. So in this case, so we uh, this is called like scenario analysis as well. So you could you could uh, put different values of the or different scenarios for the uh, disposable income and then see how the consumption expenditure will be at each one of these values. Like th then you will you will have some some scenarios. With the unconditional forecast, we know the value of the dependent of the sorry of the um, regressor or of the uh, uh, disposable income for sure. So it, this is something we don't deal with. So what we have in, in from now on, we look at the, we deal with the conditional, uh, with the conditional uh, forecast. So now going back to our model. So now we'll start with the point forecast. Okay, so point forecast means like a single value, yeah? So that's what we're gonna get now. So. It's very straightforward because what we want to do is estimate the, the point forecast 
of consumption expenditure in 2005, given that the personal disposable income from our data, from the holdover sample we have, was 31 uh, billion, then we use this because this is the equation here. So beta B1 is the estimation of beta 1, we know it. B2 is the estimation of beta 2, we, we know it. So these, these two numbers come from the estimation, from the old estimation we had. And the only thing to do here is just to add the scenario for this disposable income. What if the disposable income was 31 uh, something billion? Okay, and this will give us the value of the personal consumption expenditure in 2005. So what should we do now? Exactly. So that's what we need to evaluate. We want to evaluate this model. How close are we to the actual consumption expenditure in 2005? Okay. So if you compare this, this will give us to will, will take us to the, the the concept of the forecast error because you will always have an error. So it's very you, it is unlikely that you're gonna you're gonna predict exactly the point. Yeah. So basically, what we have here the best mean predicted value for the personal consumption uh, expenditure in 2005 is 28,000. Okay, 28,784. Uh, Billion, and the actual and this is given that the 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 um, the disposable income were thirty one, okay. But when we look at the actual value in two thousand five, it was twenty nine thousand something, yeah. So that means the difference between both our estimation of the or our forecast and the actual value. So the actual value was greater than the estimated value by nine hundred eighty seven uh, 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 billion, and that is the forecast error. So we're trying to get that model because that's how we would evaluate the, uh, the our, our model. We want to make this error as small as possible, yeah? The forecast error. So if you have two models and you compare which one is, is, is better, then you look at the forecast error. So which one produce uh, a smaller forecast error? That is the one that you, would you should, pr uh, you should uh, use to uh, forecast for forecasting. Also, we can, rather than looking at the, as we explained here, like remember this one is the forecast, the point forecast and the interval forecast. So now we get the point forecast, okay? So we could also construct the forecast band where we have, so we can uh, use this expression here. So basically, if we have the uh, error term is normal distributed, that means the fitted value of this y of the dependent variable times uh, uh, in 2005 should be also normally distributed, and the mean will equal this part, which is we actually which we which we just calculated now, this one. Okay, so that's the mean. So, and the variance can be calculated using this. So we can use this variance. So this variance is very straightforward. So the sigma squared, this is the variance of the error term, 1 over n. n is the number of uh, observations that we use. We actually use in the estimation, so 1960, 2004. And this is the income, uh, the personal disposable income in 2005. This is the mean value, x bar. And it's very straightforward, you can do that. The only thing we don't know in this is the sigma squared. So we, we agreed before that we don't observe the error term, so that means you don't observe the variance of the error term. So you used instead the sample to do that, so you have the sigma hat square. And this is how you obtain this one. So you use this, this expression. So this is the residual to obtain the uh, sigma hat square. So basically, using this, uh, we can obtain the standard error which we can help can help us to construct a confidence interval. Okay, so we use this. This is what we call the forecast band. So we'll have upper uh, band and lower lower band, and the the point estimate will be in some somewhere between these. Two. So we can estimate the uh, uh, or, or the, the forecast. We can have the forecast with some sort of. Uh, 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 with some sort of uncertainty. So again, it's going to be around the mean or around this by, this is the upper band and this is the lower band. So it's going to be for like, if we follow this, like, but we're going to be 95% probability is going to be somewhere between these two, the upper and the lower, lower band. So 
what we will construct is the 95% confidence interval for uh, the expected value of uh, y uh, at 2005. And this is the, if we follow this, this is our confidence interval. So this is the lower band, this is the upper, uh, the upper band. But if we do this at every point, then if we connect, we connect all these confidence intervals, then we can obtain the confidence band. And this is how it is in EV. So this is something we'll show, we'll show an example in uh, next time, how to, and in the seminar next week, how to produce the exactly the same, the same uh, graph. But what we have here is just we're using this equation. This. <coughs> so we produce this confidence interval for each point. Okay. Once you connect this, you get the forecast band. And the forecast band, as I said, this is the 95%, meaning that with like 95% the chances of the probability that the point will be somewhere between these two bands. So the red color show you the upper and lower uh, lower band. Okay? And these are some, some measures, the quality of this uh, estimation. And one, of one important thing to notice is the final inequality coefficient. So the closer to zero this would be, that means the, this, this would be uh, better, would be more preferred. Okay, so let's now go back to the, um, the main point. So what we did, so we, ha we, we had a consumption function. Consumption depends on income and some error term. Okay, so what we wanted to do, we wanted to be able to forecast, we want to construct a model where we can forecast the value of the dependent variable, which is consumption expenditure, in the future. We had data from 1960 to 2008. So what we did, we didn't use all this data, we used the data from 1960 to 2004. And the rest is the holdover sample, so this is something we kept to evaluate our model. Then we just run a regression using OLS, Okay, and then we can obtain the point forecast. Then we can construct the um, the what we call the the forecast band. But the idea here is that we use that holdover sample to evaluate the model, to see how close we are to this to the actual value which we know in 2005, 2006, 2007, and 2008. Okay, so we're trying to choose the model that actually make this forecast error as small as possible. Or if we compare between the two models, then we would choose the model that would produce a forecast, the smaller forecast, uh, forecast error. So, um, yeah, one thing to notice here is that if you look at this equation, which produced the variance, which we get the standard error from this variance. So if you look at this, you'll see this value. So this variance will increase, will be more, as we go away, farther away from the mean value of the regression of x. So as we go far away, like from x, that means the variance will be bigger, then will we'll, we'll the forecast error will be uh, bigger too, so it will be larger. So one, one thing to notice is the, the variance of the estimated mean values increases as value moves away or moves farther away from its mean value. That means, this means <coughs> that forecast error will increase as well. So as we go far from the mean value of x, that means the forecast error will be, uh, um, will increase and uh, and this is something probably that's 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 the main the main issue here. So if you if you go far away from from the mean value, so uh, as I said, this is something we already explained. So the third quality coefficient lies between zero and one, and when it is closer to zero, that means the motor that means the the model is 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 better. So this would be useful if you want to compare two two models. Okay, so going back to the problem we had. So you remember when when we did the all this estimation. We had we noticed that we have autocorrelation problem here, positive autocorrelation. So what we would do, we like one way to deal with this. I did here just I want to compare between the forecast band in both models. Just show you if your model is good, then your forecast and and anything like it should be better. Like so, when you choose, when you when you when you when you construct the model, you need to make sure that all the assumptions are valid that we assume about the all this estimation. So going back to this point, if you compare between the forecast band, uh, when I dealt with the um, 
with the autocorrelation, I just included an, an uh, a lagged value of the error uh, uh, of sorry of the dependent variable on the right hand side, just trying to capture this serial correlation. So you will see that the forecast error becomes smaller. So these bands become like narrower. So if you compare this here, if you look at this, compare this with the previous one. So you see, so the forecast error is 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 smaller if you have a better model, and that's what we do what that's what we said from the in the beginning. So that is that we we want to choose the model that will make this forecast error smaller. Okay, it's not going to be zero, but at least if you compare two three models, then you should choose the one that produce the smallest uh, forecast error. Okay, so this is the how to use regression model. So it's very straightforward and something that we are very familiar with and we did before. The only thing we did today is to show you how to use this for forecast, to do forecasting. So the other method which is we're going to conclude with, with the ARIMA model or Box Jenkins uh, methodology, is very straightforward. So it's not going to take long. It's very straightforward. So what, we, what it does here, uh, it analyzes the probabilistic or stochastic properties of uh, economic time series on their own. So in the previous one, the regression, what we did, we regress y, the consumption expenditure on the disposable income. With this one, you will regress y on itself, y t minus one. So y in time t uh, 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 on on itself and t minus one. So that's that that's something to let the data speak for themselves. So to tell you what information they contain from the past, and you use this to predict or to forecast uh, their values in in the in the future so this al allows for yt to be explained by past lagged values past or lagged values of yt and current and lagged values of uh, the old term as well first of all it assumes the yt is stationary but if it is not it's not a problem so you just need to difference it so this is the part because it's 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 arima model so the first part is the ar is the auto regressive part the, l the last part, ma uh, MA, is the moving average. So the first part is very straightforward, and you should be familiar with this now by now. So yt depends on itself in time t minus 1, t minus 2, up to t minus p plus some, some kind of error, which we, we assume to be a uh, white noise uh, error term. So this is the autoregressive part, and you can decide on the uh, number of lags to include by using any uh, information criteria. The moving average is the lagged or the weighted uh, average of the uh, the current and the past white noise error term. So that means you will include w ut, ut minus 1 up to ut minus, uh, minus q. So this is the ma part. So remember, if we're looking at arima, so that means we've got the first part is the autoregressive part. The second part is the moving average part. The... Um, uh, so far, it's ARMA because we, we don't have the I in the middle. So this is the autoregressive moving average. So it's ARMA model if we're dealing with the stationary data. Okay? So uh, P is the autoregressive terms. Q is the number of moving average terms. But what if we have non-stationary data and this is something we expect? So we if we have stationary data, that means it's I0, integrated of order 0. But if we have non-stationary data, uh, if you need to difference it once, that means it's I1. So remember, so I here is the, our ID is the number of, D here is the number of times that you need, how many times you need to difference this data to make it stationary, okay? And that is the I1, so it's integrated. So that's the, the, the order of integration. So what, it's, what happens here, if you, because the ARMA model would assume that YT is stationary, that it could it could be made stationary if it is not. So if it is not, you will have to difference it, and this is the the I one, the integration here. So this is the order of the integration. So arima, so it stands for this is the autoregressive part, this is the moving average part, and D here is if you need it, if the data is not stationary, which something is expected, then it would be arima, which means that you would have to difference it first before you uh, apply this model. Okay, so that's that's very straightforward model, but let's see how how we use it for uh, 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 forecast because that's that's the main objective of this model is to forecast. It just what I explain now is the construction of the model. So the AR part, the MA part, and the I. So it's arima. So that that what it means. Okay, so the first one is the there are four steps. 
Step one, identification. You need to determine the appropriate uh, lag length. So, for so you need to uh, 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 decide on the values for P, D, and Q. So, what is P? For the autoregressive part. But yeah, that's 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 true. Yeah, that's right. So that's for the autoregressive part. For the so because it's it's R lemma. So R is the autoregressive part. So Yt is de depends on Yt minus one, Yt minus two, Yt minus three, Yt minus four. So how far? I would go in the past, yeah? So that is that is P. Q is the moving average. So this is the error term part. So this is like Yt, Yt minus 1, Yt minus 2, Yt minus... How far you go that? That's, that's Q. So then you need to decide that. If your data is not stationary, then you need to difference it. Are you going to difference it once? Then D equal 1. Are you, do you have to difference it twice to make it stationary? So that means it was I2. That means D equal 2. So first, the identification, you need to design in that. And sometimes you could use the choreogram the way we explained it before. And I'll show you an example now to decide how many lags you should include. Then, once you're happy with the identification of B, Q, and D, then you can, use the you can estimate the model first. When you estimate the parameters of the choosing model, you can usually use O less, OK? Or any other method, but usually you would use O less. Then, you need to do some diagnostic checking because you want to make sure before I use for the model for forecasting, I just want to make sure I have a good model. Yeah, and that is, that is where it comes, the diagnostic uh, checking. And how would you do that? Just look at the error term. Okay, so you need to think uh, that, uh, I mean, it is, it is, there's no way that you're going to be sure that this is the best one or this is, this is the correct one, but somehow by looking at the residuals, um, then you see if they satisfy all the conditions or the assumptions, then that's fine. If not, then you just need to start again. And again, as you see, this ARIMA modeling sort of uh, modeling is kind of art more than science. So there's no like a uh, rule of thumb. So just you have to try different legs, okay, to see which mo which model is better behaving or or, or, or or it seems to be better than the other. And then once you're satisfied, then you use this for for forecasting because this, this is what we we want to do. So that's why we why we construct the whole model. I'll just finish quickly. Don't worry. But I just wanna just highlight the, the the steps again. So we now understand what ARIMA is. The construction of the model is very straightforward. But because we we already did the uh, auto regression before, so we understand what that means. But now the steps of identification, then estimation, and then you do the diagnostic checking and then forecasting. So the data or the example that we will use is the IBM Dale closing prices. The, the, pri the, 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 the variable itself, the series itself is non-stationary, but when we take the first difference, it becomes stationary. So what we have here is ARMA, no ARIM, because we're dealing with the stationary data. So one way, one first thing we need to think which, how many lags to include. The values for B, D, and Q. So for P, as we said, you could look at the uh, uh, choreogram. Uh, we I did up to 50 lags, but I can't show in the slide here more than 17 lags. So what we're looking at here, look at these spikes here, when they are outside these boundaries, they, that means this is kind of lag you need to consider here. So lag number 4, and I think I, show, I, I found more lags than that, 4, 18, 22, 35, and 43. So if you, if you um, uh, put the choreogram up to 50 lags, you will see how many lags, or you see the number of lags, the lags that are outside these two, so, okay? And these are lags that you, want you need to consider. So for example here, this is lag number four. So I should uh, include that in the, in the, in, in the uh, P and, and Q. So what I did, to show you how, how that works, I just started to estimate the model like uh, with the autoregressive part uh, and the moving average part separately, but this is not the case because you would do both together. So what, what we did, so when I look at this now, when I did the autoregressive part, it's just very straightforward estimation in, in E views. So you'll see that A4 is significant. So that means lag four should be included. Um, so that means it's YT, okay? And this is YT minus four, YT minus 18, T minus 18, lag T minus uh, 22 and, and etc. So up to T minus 43. So these are like individual lags. So I didn't, I didn't take all the lags up to 43. No, I take only one, two, three, four, five lags. No, not, fi not five lags. 
It's the lag, the fourth lag, the lag number 18th, and then etc. That's what I meant. Okay. Exactly, that's the point. So it's not the not all significant. For example, this one is not significant. This one doesn't seem to be significant at 5%. So we can uh, safely, properly drop this from the estimation. If you do the moving average part, it shows you something similar. So I did the fourth and the uh, number 18 and number 22. They seem to be significant, okay? So the idea here is, so, so this is not the moving average story. So I estimated the model again using these, uh, these lags only. So I exclude the lags that doesn't seem to be significant, and then I include only the lags that seems to be significant. What I'm trying to do here is the identification part, and I'll show you at the end in a minute, how if you solve that problem? Because without having an like a built-in function to choose that for you, you will have to do this try and, and error like to all the time to try and see which one is better. Anyway, so this is uh, with the moving average part. It shows somehow these are significant. So the two number four, eighteen, and twenty-two, and then now I estimated uh, both together. So this is the ARMA model. So four and twenty-two. That means p equal. Uh, for, for the, this is the P part, so I took two lags for P, four, lag number four and lag number 22, you'll see four and 22, the same thing for the moving average part, so that lag number four and lag number 22, they seem to be significant, so now the idea now is to use this for forecasting, so now let's say, let's assume that we're happy, we're happy with this, we're satisfied with this model, okay, remember the steps, so if you are so, so estimation, and if you are satisfied, then you jump to the forecasting. Now we, we come to the point we want to do the forecasting because we assume that we are satisfied with this estimation. And if that's the case, then we can use the model for uh, forecasting. And this is the primary objective for the model anyway. So we need to use this for forecasting. There are two types of forecasting, which I'm going to show you now. And again, it's very straightforward. And if you use it, can show you both, can produce both easily. So one is the static forecast, when you where you use the actual current and lagged values of the forecast variable. But the dynamic one, the dynamic forecast, when you obtain the first uh, period forecast, then you use the previously forecast values of the forecast variable. So let's see how that works. So this is the static one, okay? If we just look at the one of the uh, uh, stati uh, st statistics here, which is the thyroid inequality coefficient, we said if this is closer to um, to zero, that means it's, it's it's a better model, yeah? So let's look at this. So this is a static one, and compare this with this one. This is the dynamic one. So if you look at this, the thyroid inequality coefficient, you'll see this one is bigger. So this one is the smaller one. So that means this one be is, is performed better than the static one performed better than the uh, dynamic forecast. So with what we did, we tried to identify the number of lags for P and Q. And this is something very difficult to do. Uh, 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 I mean, as we say, it's like kind of art. You need to try and until you find which lags to, to include. But now, if you use, I think, from... Um, I don't know from 8, version 8 or version 9, but now if use does this for you very uh, easily. So what if use does, there's like an option in if use, which is the automatic selection for ARIMA model. So it tells you the best uh, model uh, that you should, you should consider. So for example, I did the same for the same data, and, and I used the automatic ARIMA selection. So the, the previous ones, I tried, tried to look at which lag to include. But if you saved you all this effort by going to the automatic selection, and this is the summary, and I'm going to show you the estimation now, the, the, the forecast now. So if you look at how many uh, models if you evaluated is 100 models. So you would have to try manually 100 times to see which one is the best. And then it came up with the conclusion that the selected model should be this model. So the meaning that four lags of the dependent variable of y and zero of the q. So q equals zero. Okay? And that is the estimation, or this is the uh, uh, using this model, and this is the, the forecast. So again, if you go to this one, so you 0, 0, 0.002, and this one is point 
zero two, so the, the static one is, is better than the dynamic one. But also something to note is that this is very close to the one that we had here. But the difference is that we spend like so much time just trying and to get that one. And with automatic selection, uh, arrange automatic selection e-views, you can just do one click, just you get the you get the best model, and it evaluated like hundred uh, hundred models. Among those hundred models, this model is the best model, and this is or this is the selected model. Okay, so zero and four. This is the P part, and this is the Q part. So there's like zero for the uh, moving average part, but for the P part or the autoregressive part, the AR part, it took it uses uh, uh, four lags, and it gave very similar results to the one that we, we kept, like we, we had to try um, many times, okay? And that is, that is the, 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 whole I the whole idea. Any question? 